Thanks, Scott. Good afternoon and welcome, everybody, to this um, 2016 Europe Day celebration. Uh, my name is Anthony Elliott, and I'm the uh, director of the executive director of the Hawke EU Centre and director of the Hawke Research Institute, where the Hawke EU Centre is actually located. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge um, that we're meeting today on Ghana land and to pay our respects to the traditional owners of this beautiful land. I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests. We have, uh, in addition to today's guest speakers, we have Consul Generals from both Greece and uh, Belgium. Welcome. Also our colleagues and friends to this special lunchtime event. Europe Day commemorates the 9th of May 1950 when the French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman presented his proposal on the creation of an organised Europe to help maintain peaceful relationships between European countries. It's an occasion to remember the historical context in which the Union was actually created and the progress um, that's been made, the difficulties that have been overcome as well as the broader original aims of the European project. The European Union has of course seen so many changes and now in its current form with 28 member states and over 500 million citizens um, is active in a wide range of areas covering pretty much everything from development aid uh, right through to the environment. One of the EU's main goals is to promote human rights both internally and globally. Human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights. These are absolutely central core values of the EU. And this is obviously a major concern today with the current uh, explosion in enforced migration across Europe with more than a million migrants and refugees crossing into Europe in 2015 and of course showing now no signs of abating throughout 2016. The Hawke EU Centre for Mobilities, Migrations and Cultural Transformations is a jointly funded European Commission initiative with the University of South Australia which um, seeks to develop dialogue and cooperation between the European community and Australia in regards to the major global transformations of our age, all the way from the proliferation of global travel, tourism and transport, through to the desperate dispersal of asylum seekers, refugees and migrants. We pursue a vigorous program of activities under a mission to directly address the political importance of planning and learning through these um, bilateral dialogues and particularly in regard to our shared commitments to the respect and promotion of human rights, fundamental freedoms, democracy and the rule of law. But also, and crucially, we're very heavily engaged with the political, the economic and the cultural benefits of the EU in its relationship um, to Australia. Today, I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers and through their presentations, they'll be providing insights into how our communities that they represent are creating a vibrant and culturally diverse experience in contemporary Adelaide. Our first speaker, Mr. Jean-Christophe Trentinella, is the director of Alliance Francais in Adelaide and a member of the Hawke EU Centre Advisory Board. He's going to talk today about the Creative France initiative launched earlier this year in Adelaide. Please join me, with you. Join me now in welcoming Jean Christophe. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, chers amis, it is a pleasure to be here with you on this uh, beautiful day. <laughs> uh, very European itself uh, to celebrate Europe Day with you. As um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the amazing team of the Oak EU Centre. Um, so, Executive Director uh, um, uh, Anthony Elliott, of course, Associate Director um, uh, Susan Buchmann, and Centre Coordinator uh, Nicola Pitt. 
And uh, I'd like also to acknowledge the support of the Orkin Center for the Creative France initiative, particularly in South Australia. Um, it is humbling to be invited to speak in front of you today uh, on this third day, which commemorates, as Anthony mentioned, with the liberation of uh, Robert Schumann. Robert Schumann was a um, French foreign ministry, and he's very much considered as to be one of the founding fathers of the European Union, the Council of Europe, and NATO. So on the 9th May of 1950, we gave a speech which lays, laid the foundation of this supranational organization, which will foster collaboration in such a way to create common interests between European countries, which would lead to political integration and create a condition for peace. So he said the following, Europe will not be made all at once. <coughs> according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements which first create de facto solidarity. And solidarity is a very important point. In France there is a saying. It's sometimes it's attributed to Jean Cocteau, sometimes to Pierre Reverdy. In any case it's French. So, and here it goes. We say, il n'y a pas d'amour Il n'y a que des preuves d'amour. There is no love. There are only proofs of love. Which is probably something I should have remembered before Mother's Day, but that's uh, another subject. Uh, in other words, without concrete actions and achievements, any project, any relationship, any collaboration is just a dream, a utopia. There are many proofs of love between Australia and France, and no doubt you have obviously heard about the latest one, which is the signature of a contract uh, about submarines. And this, of course, provides me with a perfect opportunity to transition to Creative France. Creative France is an international communication campaign with the goal to shine the spotlight on the leading individual and major innovation that make France the country it is today. It is also a means to promote, to promote French appeal by showing the world what country uh, France does, what the country does best, and the areas in which it excels. So, of course, the needs with the submarines is now obvious. However, as a person uh, which works in the field of education and culture, I personally rejoice more for uh, an initiative such as the um, bilingual program with France and Australia that will uh, happen in 2017 in uh, Adelaide. The South Australian chapter of Creative France is very much focused on the cultural and educational dimensions of innovation with a series of innovative and creative meetings taking place all throughout 2017 and beyond. Several French artists, creators, intellectuals will visit Australia and particularly South Australia to present their work. You may have attended the opening of the French Festival of the Arts this year with a group, um, group F, which delivered a very stunning show. And you may have attended the Alliance Française French Film Festival, which just closed two weeks ago. In the following months, you will see other major exhibitions uh, with a lot of French Australian connections. The first will be a photographic exhibition at the Library, State Library of South Australia, opening the 7th of June, which will feature the works of Frédéric Moucher, which is a photographer who took pictures of the iconic places where the French explorers arrived in Australia. And in July, you will be able to see at the South Australian Museum um, the work of um, Charles Alexandre Le Sueur and Nicolas Martin Petit, uh, who accompanied Nicolas Baudin on his travel and his explorations. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, there will be later on a series of events through uh, the French and Belgian Honorary Consulate, which is the Poppy Trail project. 
which will commemorate the very strong relation, very strong connection between Australia and the European countries through the First World War. So these are just events um, that will mark the whole year. And of course, the main key word here is innovation, and through displayed through all French creative industries and endeavors that will contribute to reinforce the image of France abroad. So culture and creativity are predominant elements in the French economy, and we have about 1.3 million jobs linked to the creative industries in France, which on a relatively small country is, is really a lot. And the initiative created in France and South Australia illustrates the diversity and abundance of businesses, men and women who participate uh, with all these different creative industries, the art sector, the education sector, to foster these connections between France and Australia. So, a few weeks ago, uh, a French academician, uh, Eric Orsena, was in the day. He was actually touring Australia. And I had the great privilege to share his company for a whole evening and dine with him. And he said during his tour that globalization poses new challenges. Technically, we were able to face with them, but it is necessary sometimes to wake in our consciousness. And the spirit of Creative France Australia is, is that. It's to stimulate our awareness and to provoke debate. The local initiative came about with the collaboration of 15 organizations in the field of culture, education, and the arts, among which the Alliance Française, of course, the FACHI, we have the three universities, including, of course, the ESA, um, the City Council of Only, City Council of Victoria, I'm not going to list all of them, and of course, we have the support of different organizations, among which the French Embassy, um, and the EU Centre for Mobilities, Migration and Cultural Transformation. The first realization of um, the essay chapter of in France is very much the construction of a website, which is called Bonjour Adelaide, which features everything French related to the arts, to um, education, and also to businesses in South Australia. So it's really to map out all the connections, past and present, and hopefully future, between Australia and France. Now, I'd like to go back to um, a little bit of the history of uh, your day, and um, I'd like to quote one of our former presidents, François Mitterrand. François Mitterrand, in 1995, said the following in front of, uh, in Strasbourg, actually, in front of the European Parliament. He said, and it was his last public address, and this was uh, in order to mark the, it was the keynote speech to mark France's presidency of the EU. And he said the following, he said, nationalism is war, plain and simple. Uh, this is why uh, education is so much critical. We summarize, may well be uh, necessary evil to reinforce frontiers that and uh, so something new in this uh, very uncertain world. However, it is only through education that we can hope one day to achieve a world without borders. And it is education that will um, and particularly fostering curiosity, which is not only the engine of achievement, but it, which is the antidote of intolerance, uh, bigotry and prejudice that we can hope to uh, achieve, and this is maybe a, a little a topic, uh, to achieve a, a world where we see more peace and a little bit less conflict. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Christophe, um, for that particularly insightful overview and um, for us to learn more about the creative um, France initiative, it's no doubt welcome news to Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull to hear so much underscoring of the term innovation. <laughs> um, 
I also want to particularly thank, just take this moment to thank John Christoph. He's a very good friend um, to the Hawke EU Centre. As I say, he sits on our advisory board and um, he continues to advise as well. Thank you. Um, our second guest speaker today is Mr. Adrian Vanovich, the uh, inaugural honorary consul of Slovenia for South Australia. Adrian's had a long association with the Slovenian community in Adelaide. He established the Slovenia Australia channel on YouTube, and he's actively involved in the Slovenian Australian Chamber of Commerce. Today, he's going to talk about the characteristics of Slovenia's membership of the EU, as well as the migration of Slovenians to South Australia and their contributions to Adelaide's vibrant multicultural society. Please join with me now in welcoming Adrian. Jefferson's inspiration as the beginning of U.S. Slovenian Until the late 20th century, foreign rulers governed Slovenia, including the Habsburg Monarchy and the Austrian Hungarian Empire from 8, 1867 to the end of World War II, or World War I, sorry, in 1918. Throughout the past millennium, the Slovenians being ruled over by others, they managed to preserve <coughs> an identity, mainly achieved through culture and language. This is astonishing food. After being part of the Yugoslavia for more than 70 years, Slovenians almost unanimously opted for independence in 
and a 99, I think so, saw almost 90% of Indians electorate voted for us in an independent state. On June 25, 1991, Sloven became an independent state. The determination to build a nation based on the principles of democracy and the rule of law was challenged immediately. A relatively short and decisive armed conflict with the Yugoslav army, the first conflict in Europe since World War II, resulted in months of negotiations. Those times of transition were a trial of the will of the Slovenian nation, requiring determination and courage, as well as the intellectual property, uh, capacity, spiritual power, unity, responsibility, and statesmanship. Slovenia's quest for independence was confirmed by actions of the international community. In January 1992, the European community recognised Slovenia, and Australia and Canada became the first overseas countries to recognise Slovenia, also in January 1992. Slovenia's priority is developed into a modern democratic country based on the rule of law, market economy, and private ownership, with important social and environmental components. The European Union is based on these principles, so it's fitting that Slovenia has been part of the European family for centuries as a member of the European Union, which joined in 2004. EU membership has brought many economic benefits to Slovenia. A larger internal market with additional schemas, increased opportunities for exports of investment goods, increased investment opportunities, reduced risks, the opportunity to bring down costs with the aim of increasing competitiveness. Better access to equipment, know-how, new technologies, reduced business risks, more favourable access to capital, new employment and education opportunities, and possibly a positive penetration of new markets. EU membership has also meant that Slovenia has become better known, its culture enriched, and its national confidence increased. Australia and Slovenia signed a bilateral working and holiday visa arrangement on June 16, 2015. That came into effect on January 1 this year. This agreement allows 200 young people aged 18 to 30 from each country to spend one year in each other's country. English is widely spoken in Slovenia, so if you visit, you will have no trouble getting around. In Slovenia, there are several types of higher education institutions, mainly universities, faculties, art academies, and independent education, education institutions. Today, there are four uh, universities in Lama, Maribor, Kibonska University, and Lama Pizza, an independent institution for higher education. One international association of universities and 44 private higher education institutions. There is no tuition fee for undergraduate and master's degree students for people with Slovenian citizenship and other citizens of EU countries at public universities in Slovenia. In the US uh, filmmakers, Michael Moore's latest documentary titled Where to Invade Next. By where the US should invite next, he suggests that the US should invite Slovenia across its three <laughs> Are there Australian companies in Slovenia? Uh, yes, there are. Did you know Australia's Harvey Norman has stores in Slovenia? Slovenia was the first country in Europe where Harvey Norman opened a store, and this was in Slovenia's capital city in London in 2002. Because Slovenia is strategically located in Central Europe, this provides Harvey Norman the opportunity to expand to other countries to the West, North and East, efficiently when so desires. Not long ago, we commemorated Anzac Day in Australia. There is a significant historical military connection between South Australia and Slovenia. During World War II, South Australian soldier Ralph Churches organised World War II's largest and most successful escape from PNW camp without a drop of blood being spilled. Ralph had been captured by the Nazis in Greece and was placed in a Nazi PNW camp located on the outskirts of Slovenia's second largest city, Maribor. With the help of Slovenian partisans, he organised a mass escape of 100 POWs and they set off on foot for 350 kilometres to Slovenia in southern Slovenia, where five EC3 airlines flew them out to Burry in southern Italy. Ralph's ordeal is not that widely known because he was, not, he was told by the Australian military at the time that he was not allowed to tell the story. 
experience in Iraq. He was, given, he was not given a direct answer from the military as to why he could not do so, but he, spe he suspected because after the war, many became part of the Socialist Yugoslavia, this was most likely the reason. Forty years passed from the conclusion of World War II and Ralph was given the clear by the military to tell his story, and he proceeded to write a book called 100 Miles of the Crow Flies, and this book was available on Amazon. He published his book in 1996. <coughs> When he gained independence in 1991, it became a free market economy. So under these conditions, it was much easier for Ralph to tell the story. Ralph was no longer with us. He passed away in 2014 at the age of 97. But his legendary bravery to high South Australia is something he did than I cast in place. Every instant when they celebrate Ralph's great escape, such as the significance of Jimmy. Ralph's escape route is Australia's perfect trail in Europe. Uh, these uh, four videos we have on the Australian Australia channel on YouTube to watch. Uh, he was also given a uh, Golden England Award last one. Just to finish off, um, the crazy sausage that you see everywhere on Australian supermarket shelves was brought to Australia by post World War II civilian markets. Francis sausage called Hanska Kobasa in Slovenia it originated in Slovenia in the area of Ukraine, after which the sausage was named. Back in the day, it was common practice to name a product after the location of where it originated. Kranska sausage. The European Commission has entered the Kranska sausage in its register as the 27th Slovenian product of protected designations of origin and particular. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Adrian, for that. I didn't know that about the Kransky sausage. I'm, I am hoping that with your help, we might be able to find a way to import Savoy Zizek uh, to the book that you sent. Of course, one of um, Slovenia's most famous philosophers and social theorists. Um, I'd now like to introduce my um, friend and colleague, uh, Professor Susan Luckman, who is the Associate Director of Research and Programs at the Hawke EU Centre. Susan's going to now tell us a bit more about the Hawke EU Centre and crucially, she's also going to present the scholarships today to our successful students. Uh, two speakers. Uh, thank you everybody for braving the weather to be here today. Uh, there's still some sweets to go, I notice, and you'll probably need that to fortify you before we head out there, so I won't be too long. There's just a few things that sound like indicated I would like to announce. And I don't actually have uh, an actual presentation thing to give people, but um, I'll at least give some sense of some of the work that we're doing in terms of staff and student mobilities around the Union Centre. I'd very much like to present them with an airfare, but uh, in the sense of an actual ticket, but um, maybe we could do some sort of prop tickets next time for our next presentation. So one of the key remits of the EU Centre is to provide opportunities for researchers and students and staff of the university to learn more about the EU, either through study, research or exchange. We have a number of offerings at the EU Centre that allow staff and students to travel and connect with EU counterparts, we also have programs like the EU Hall Hebrew Centre Internship program that each year invites talented undergraduate journalism student to join us in the centre to gain hands-on experience working in that kind of environment. And we work with uh, the School of Communication, International Studies and Languages on that. They have a fantastic journalism program that's the oldest in South Australia. And one of the really valuable things there is while often journalism students and people when you think of journalism training people things like news outlets, a lot of these graduates will go into fields and organisations like the EU, like government, like NGOs, and this provides a useful opportunity for students to get that kind of experience working in PR and journalism. 
Now today as we've indicated, I'd like to announce the winners of some of our recently competitively advertised research opportunities. And I'd also like to first acknowledge that there are quite a few staff in the room um, and postgraduate students who are travelling with uh, EU Centre funding but weren't party to this, but are very much welcome and thank them for turning up today and for their fantastic and productive time in their own journeys. The first announcement today is an opportunity to conduct doctoral research training at the Glasgow Refugee and Migration Network at the University of Glasgow later this month. The competitive fellowship was advertised to postdoctoral students researching in one or more areas of migration, refugees and asylum seekers and includes a training course and networking with other high, high degree researchers and early career researchers at Grand Met in Glasgow. And we are very pleased to now announce that the winner of the 2016 Grand Met Fellowship is Ms. Heidi Price.
Susan, and uh, congratulations again to our recipient um, holders. It's just fantastic that this centre is able to support students um, to do these things, to conduct these important initiatives in Europe and to uh, have the Hawking Centre engaging with Europe in this manner. Um, the number of staff here know only last week we were uh, lamenting uh, the current uh, financial pressures uh, on the higher education, uh, particularly for our for students, for undergraduates and postgraduates. And it's a really crucial initiative that the Hawke EU Centre, uh, with our partners, are able to develop these kind of initiatives um, going forward. I'd like to, that's pretty much it for the day, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming out and for joining us uh, for today's celebrations. I would particularly like, I and mean, this is a team effort at the Hawke EU Centre, um, today wouldn't have happened, particularly if it had not been for the um, efforts of uh, Dr Nicola Pitt with us, the Centre Coordinator at the Hawke EU, uh, to Lynette Cobus, who works uh, with us uh, at the Hawke EU, uh, Tammy and others that, that have uh, contributed to the preparation uh, of uh, today's successful event. Finally, um, we've heard lots of different people quoted today, and I just finished with a different one. It's 70 years ago, that Sir Winston Churchill delivered his infamous speech, Turbulent and Mighty Continent, where he concluded that speech by saying, it's now time for Europe to rise up. Well, it strikes me that in 2016, if you think of everything that has been thrown at the EU, surely by now uh, it's pretty much seen the lot from the global financial crisis, through the migration crisis, through the Brexit, pretty hard to imagine what other challenges might come Europe's way. Seems to me it's stronger and better than ever. We at the Hawking you see that very, very proud to have this association with the European Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much.